um, uh, we're glad everybody's here. So let's have a word of prayer and, and we'll get started. Um, Father, thank you for uh, being with us tonight. Um, thank you for my brothers and sisters who were trying to, to watch us. And uh, Lord, I just pray your blessings on us as we consider your word tonight. So Father, be with us. Thank you for all your goodness to us, Lord. We are so excited about all the things that you were doing with us and through us here. And for all the folks in Utah and Kentucky and every other place that's watching tonight, Lord, we thank you. So Father, be with us in Christ's name. Amen. All right. So, okay. We got, uh, finally got that working. Um, yay. I can hear you. Yes. I don't know what the deal is, but, um, it's, it's finally working that way. All right. So let's, uh, uh, let's have a look at our, our Bible study tonight. Um, on the, uh, on the prayer sheets here, uh, looking at the front page, how many of you, um, uh, well, we, we were gonna, we were gonna test you. Uh, because if you look at your notes, we're only going through um, verse 14, uh, but on the prayer sheet it says verse 16. And the reason is, um, kind of like um, when, uh, when I go to uh, Golden Corral to eat, uh, my, my eyes are bigger than my stomach, and, and my uh, um, uh, optimism of, of getting through uh, verses uh, 11 through 16 tonight was uh, uh, overexcited. So uh, uh, we've got First uh, John chapter four, eleven through fourteen. So let's let's take a look at it, and uh, then we will uh, come back and have a much much closer look. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. We have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. All right, so let's go back to uh, verse 11. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Typically, when we think about what a love relationship means, because we are basically selfish creatures, we think that if someone loves me, then I've got to then I've got to love them back. Um, and if if I love them, then then they'll love me, and we think that's how a, a love relationship ought to work. So when a young man professes his love to his, his girlfriend, he does so with the hope and expectation then that she will love him back, that she will love him in return. Um, if a newlywed loves their in-laws, they do so hoping that their in-laws will, will love them. Um, uh, Kathy and I both said that uh, uh, if we ever ran away from home, she was going to go to my mother's house. And if I ever ran away from home, I told her I was going to her mother's house. Um, so, you know, that's the way we think of things. But it's not this way with God. Because God's love is not eros, which is the Greek word for romantic love, from which we get the word erotic. Uh, nor is it uh, phileo, which is the Greek word for uh, family love or friendship. Um, that's why Philadelphia is called the city of brotherly love. It's from that Greek word meaning friendship, phileo, Philadelphia. Um, but God's, God's love is agape. And we're going to talk a lot about that tonight. So if God so loves us, what his word is saying is we're, we're not told to love him back, but that we are to love one another, which is different, which is different. It's not that we are to love him back. If God so loved us, we need to love God. No, if God so loves us, then we need to love one another. This is how we are to show, to sh this is how we are to show God our response to his love for us by loving 
others. The ones who he sent Christ to die for. Well, so if we're going to love agape, if we're going to truly understand what that means, what the essential character of agape love really means, then we need to see it best when such love is directed towards those who are not easy to love. And that's, that's, that's where all of this begins to get very different than what we're normally accustomed to. Because all too often, the least of these, you know, jo those that Jesus says we are to treat like him, the least of these are the least precisely because they are the worst of these. There's a reason why they're the least of these, and often in a lot of cases. And so can we really love the least of these when the least of these are the worst of these? This is, this is how Jesus was constantly with people. Um, anybody who came to him, regardless, no matter what, did he ever turn anybody away who had a need? No. I mean, a Roman, for crying out loud, said, you know, my, my servant is sick. Uh, people who had leprosy, which was contagious. Whatever it was, Jesus was willing to address the needs of those people. Jesus was willing to love them. Remember how he treated those who crucified him. You know, go back and watch those, that 30 to 45 minutes of, of the, the flogging and torture and crucifixion of Christ in Mel Gibson's movie, The Passion of the Christ. I think it says probably as realistic to what a real crucifixion was like and what Jesus went through as anything you'll ever see. It is absolutely horrific. And yet what is Jesus' response, not only to the people who brutally treated him, but also to the people who were standing around spitting at him, laughing at him, teasing at him, jeering at him. You know, he saved others. Why don't you save yourself? Come down and we will believe you. Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. His response was a forgiveness that can only be poured out of that agape kind of love, that sacrificial, unconditional love. This is how that kind of love works, and not just for Christ, but for you and me. This is how it works for us. To love people that are not easy to, to love, that's the thing. And loving people who are easy to love, well, that's not, that's not real agape love, because Jesus himself basically said, you don't, you don't need God to do that. In the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapter 5, verses 46 through 47, Jesus asked the question, For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And he, he picked a particular profession of people who were absolutely the worst of the worst. They were the worst of the least. Do not even the tax collectors do the same. If you greet only your brothers, what are you doing more than any others? Do not even the Gentiles, the people who don't know God, do not even the Gentiles do the same. In other words, if you only love those who love you, and are only gracious to those who are your own friends and your own family, how are you different than anybody else who doesn't have God in their life? It, you know, people who are devout atheists may love their children. People who are devout atheists may love their spouse, love their mother. Um, back during the, the Cold War, uh, uh, the uh, British uh, rock star Sting had a, uh, a song entitled, uh, Do the Russians Love Their Children Too? Uh, well, you hope so, you know. You hope that that'll keep them from pushing the button. 
Don't they love their children too? Well, you know what? Yes, they do. Yes, they do. Even even a, a good Soviet atheist communist party member there in, inside the Kremlin, he loves his children too. So you don't have to know God to be able to love your children. You don't have to be able to, to know God to, you know, love your friends. That's, that's, this is what Jesus is saying. Do not even the Gentiles do the same. Even the godless can be gracious to their own friends and family. Even the godless love their mothers. Where does being Christian, where does being saved, where does being in Christ make a difference in your life by loving others unconditionally and sacrificially by loving the unlovable by loving others the way god loves you by loving others agape that's the greek word then we begin to understand the next verse in the Sermon on the Mount, in verse 48, therefore you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. And so often we choke on that because why? We think that being perfect somehow means being hypermoral. You know, we don't step on a crack because it'll break our mother's back. I mean, we, that's, that's, that's how we think about being perfect. And so... When we looked at verses 7 through 10 a week or so ago, back before I was off in Atlanta last week, and by the way, thank you to Billy Joe for being in here last week to lead prayer time. In those verses, we said that it is of primary importance to us to understand, as we think about Christianity, that our Christianity is not defined by how moral we are, or how faithful we are to our church, or anything else that comes with human sort of standards. Our Christianity is defined in our relationship to God and to others. This is how we are to understand the Christianity that we find here in 1 John. Moreover, if we do not in fact love one another, then the existence of God, I mean, let me try that again. If we do, in fact, love one another, if we actually do love people the way that Jesus loves people, then the existence of God is proven to us. Buddy. Yes, sir. Can I tell you something about love before we get off, off the subject here? Yes, sir. Although we won't be off the subject for several months, but go ahead. Uh huh. Yes, sir. And the only thing that, uh, I heard on there was they had one sentence on the program. There is only one happiness in this life to love and be loved. Mm -hmm. and that was a statement by George Saints. I don't, I don't know who George is, but it, uh, I, I heard did not hear anything about Jesus or the Lord. Now, there, there may have been. Uh, yes. Um, <laughs> no, it's, it's not that simple and I'm drawing a blank right now, but yes. Um, I, I, I couldn't understand it, but, uh, I, and I heard one lady, you know, they had to cast it down. Now he, he had, he died on the fourth of June. Yes. And he was buried. Yes. Mm -hmm. so four white people. I mean, actually white. Right. Just down the road, can't go in there dark. Right. You know? uh, and then I had four people that said, but they, they, they treated us so well. Mm -hmm. they, they were so appreciative that, that we were there. But I heard one lady do something for to the viewing process, and she, she was crying. She said, I will see you. 
Okay. Um, and the second cup of coffee I had today, Jim, did kick in. The language is called Hmong, um, but there are multiple languages in, in Cambodia, but primarily, and I suspect their, their language is Hmong. But there's one um, Right. Uh, anyway, I, I, I basically have never been, and I, I, I'm wanting to go. Uh huh. Maybe my neighbor close neighbor. Yeah, and you've done a brilliant job of ministering and, to that family. And uh, I, I wanted to see what it was like. Well, here's the difference, and that's a good example that you gave because the quote you shared was the 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 what was it? The only happiness in life is to love and be loved. Yes. All right. See, that's the difference because what Christ would say is. We love whether we are loved or not. It's not about being loved. It's just a matter of loving. Uh, and that's, that's, that's the catch. I gave you a copy. Uh, I don't have time to look at it. Yes, I still have it. Yeah. it was, they did a great job of putting everything together, but no Bible verse and everything of that, of that nature. And, uh, See, that's, that's, the, that's, the, that's, the, that's the thing. When we talk about unconditional love, I'm going to love you, Jim, whether you love me back. Uh, it's not about whether I'm being loved. It's only about whether I am being loving. And, and it's, not, it's not purely about you. I have a responsibility to God to love you, whether you love me back or not. And this is the thing that so many of us don't get. Uh, you know, we, we, have, we hear people say, well, why should I do for them if they're not going to do for me? Um, because you're what's the word? Christian, that's the word. Uh, you've got to love them whether they do anything back for you or not. Uh, you know, that's, that's the difference in being Christian. I don't wait for them to reciprocate to me. I'm going to love for them. I'm going to do for them whether they, in fact, Jesus said it's even better if they can't do anything back for you, just to love them as it is. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, sweet people. Mm-hmm. Very, very nice, sweet and people. Family, yeah. Family was nice, but they, they did go to school and gave them a Bible. Right. They didn't have a Bible. And, uh, you know, I, I was driving to church to read. Mm-hmm. And they made changes. Well, I'm going to come back over and visit the family again. I'm not done with them. Anytime you want to. Yeah, I'll do it. Uh-huh. That's right. I think John MacArthur's out there too. Right.
Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, but they, 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 the worship moved. That little fast hand back there. Oh, right. He was, and, and they, they, they bowed down and prayed, and, and the wings would stay down and slow the ball. They had to have kings to get out. Yeah. So it, it's, it's such a tragedy to see something like that. Well, but that's, again, that's, that's the part about what agape love really means. It's that unconditional sacrificial love that I'm going to act in a loving way towards you regardless of what your response is because I'm not accountable to God for your response to me. I'm, recount I'm accountable to God only for my actions toward you. Uh, how you respond is up to you. That's between you and God. Um, so, you know, I'm going to love as Christ loves Regardless of what the response is, I'm going to forgive as he forgives, regardless of what the response is. Uh, that's, that's, this is the point that, that John is, is making. Um, well, I, my was to run you off your course. No, no. I, I just had uh, a barrier that's only one happiness in this life to love the people. And they must have put a lot of faith in that because that's the only thing they had in there. They had anything to do with it. Yeah. And they, you know, like I said, I don't know what he was really preaching, but I, I couldn't understand it. Not his words. But yeah. He said for an hour and a half. Your hermong's not, not real good? Not in <laughs> So your English might not be real good either. Yeah. Well, it, it is in those four states. Okay. <laughs> Verse 12 uh, says, No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. Um, if we love one another as he loves, then the existence of God is proven to us. No one has seen God at any time, yet if we love as he loves... He abides in us, he lives in us, and his love is perfected in us. Um, and the truth of the matter is we're only able to love as he loves because he lives in us. Uh, we don't love the least of these. We don't love the worst of these. We don't love the people who are crucifying us on our own without God. Without God, we cannot say, Father, forgive them. Uh, without God, we want fire and brimstone to come down on their head. Uh, you know, but with God, we can love exactly as he loves. Uh, so we know then that he lives when we see the power and presence of his love poured out of us. Uh, as we're able to love the least and the lost, as we're able to love the worst as we're able to love those who are the unlovable. Just like the, the effects, if you think about wind, if you think about electricity, you, you don't see it, but you see, that you see its effects, so you know that it's there, right? Uh, if you walk into your house and you turn on a light switch and it doesn't come on, you think, well, either I've lost power or that you know, the bulb's out or, or something, uh, the switch is bad. There, there's something that's keeping the electricity from doing what it needs to do. Uh, you know, that's how you know that the power is there when you flip the switch. You can't see it. Uh, hopefully in your house you can't hear it. Uh, but when, when it's pouring out, when it's doing what it's supposed to do, that's how you know that it's present. Same is true with the love of God. You, you can't see it. You can't taste it. You can't feel it, but when it's pouring out and doing what it's supposed to do, that's how you know that it's there. That's how you know that God's real, because on your own, you can do nothing. That's right. Yep. And you've been paying attention. I'm so excited about that. Um, 
And folks, this is why, to me, this is why there's such pain in the world. Um, you know, the, the cynic looks around at how the world is and say, and ask the question, where is God? You know, if God were truly a loving God, why would he allow, you know, pain and suffering? Uh, God's question to us is, why do we allow it? Uh, you know, why do we allow the pain and suffering in the world? Um, you know, that's, that's what he's given us his love for, to be able to reach out to the world and love the world as it is, not as not waiting for the world to be. Um, you know, again, when did Jesus ever turn anybody away? When did anybody come to Jesus with a need? Even when his own mother came to him and said, you know, we're, we're kind of running low on wine. Mom, come on. This is not the time or place. But you can do this, you know. Well, Mom, that's not the point, you know. This isn't the time. Well, you know, but it kind of is because we're running low on wine, you know. You know, he didn't turn his own mother away. And honestly, he would have had a legitimate point if he had, but he wouldn't. When the, 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 the woman up in Tyre, up in Lebanon, uh, comes to him and says, you know, my, my daughter is ill. Jesus kind of teases with her uh, and says, well, you know, the, the food is only for the children of Israel you know, not the dogs. And, and she fires back and says, well, you know, even the dogs get the crumbs. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, Jesus laughs and says, I love your faith. You know, go home, your, your daughter is healed. Jesus didn't ever turn anybody away. When, when, the, when he's on the Mount of Transfiguration with Peter, James, and John, and he comes down from the mountain, there's this big hubbub going on in, in he pulls one of the disciples aside who probably paid somebody off to make sure that his name was kept out of it and, and said, what is the problem? And he said, well, this, this guy here brought his son to us and the Pharisees are here and all the people are here and we can't do anything with his son. <sighs> Jesus loses his patience with the disciples at that point. How long am I going to have to be with you? What's wrong with you that you don't understand? I've talked, we covered this in class. This is only done by prayer and fasting. You, and, and, and so bring, bring the boy to me. And, you know, and so Jesus heals the boy and, and sends the boy and his father along on his way. If we're going to be who Jesus called us to be, then we've got to love the same way he loves. We don't turn anybody away. We, we find their need Whoever God brings lays in our path. Um, you know, this is this is how we serve. It's you know, um, C.S. Lewis warned his atheist friends to always be careful of your reading, because he said God is unscrupulous. He'll jump out at you in the worst of places. Uh, well, that's true of of your reading. It's also true of what you watch and what you hear. Um, and so one of my favorite uh, stories in, in movies is, is uh, the, the story of the Four Feathers. Uh, it's written during Victorian England. Uh, the British Army's there in the Sudan. Uh, and um, this one particular British uh, soldier is, is rescued by an African and saved and the, the British uh, soldier asked the African at one point, why are you helping me? And, the, the, and, and you, you can see the, the, the setup, right? You have the, the, the wealthy, privileged, powerful English soldier indebted to the nearly naked, illiterate, uh, poor African. But it's the African who's helping him, saving him. Why are you helping me? And the one who shouldn't know speaks back to the one who should know and says, I have no choice. God puts you in my path. And as long as God puts you in my path, I can't do anything except care for you till you're able to go on your own way. Oh, said the British soldier. <laughs> 
you know, that's the point. That's, that's basically the book of Acts right there. Um, God put you in my path, and so I can't do anything. Isn't that the story of Philip and the Ethiopian? What's he doing on that desert road in the first place? Because God put him there. Well, why is he there? Well, he doesn't know. You know, we'll go up to that chariot. Um, God puts the Ethiopian in the man's path, in Philip's path. And the only thing Philip can do is what? Whatever his need is. I'm, I'm reading your Bible here. I don't understand. It's the book of Isaiah. He's, he's talking about someone that sounds amazing. Is he talking about himself or someone else? How can I understand unless somebody helps me? And Philip says, you know, funny you should ask because I know exactly who he's talking. In fact, I know really, really well who he's talking about. And he leads the guy to Christ. You know, and on this desert road, lo and behold, here's some water. Can we stop and get baptized? Sure, absolutely. Let's, let's do. Um, you know, we, we love those whom God puts in our path regardless of who they are or what their issue is. So why is there so much pain in the world? Because there's so few people in whom actually God lives and his love can then come out. Uh, someone said that a saint is nothing more than someone that God lives inside. Um, if you want to know what makes somebody exceptional, it's not them. It's just that God lives inside them. That's what makes them a saint. All right, lastly here in this, this, this one part here of verse 13, by this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. This is what Paul was trying to get us to understand in 1 Corinthians 13. Generally speaking, and if you say in a Baptist church in a small group study like this or something, uh, Yes, I have been baptized in the Spirit. Instantly, you're in trouble with most of the rest of the group because of the way that we have misappropriated what that means. And this is what 2,000 years ago, Paul was trying to help correct us to understand what does it mean to be baptized in the Spirit. It does not mean that we are superior to other people. It does not mean that we have something special about us, that we are empowered with the tongues of angels and so forth. No, being baptized in the Spirit means that the Holy Spirit of Christ has come to live in us so that we may love as he loves, whereby we can then live as he lives. To be baptized in the Spirit means that the Holy Spirit of Christ himself lives within us so that we can love as he loves, so then we can live as he lives. This is what it means. This is the whole point. This is what Paul is saying over and over again in 1 Corinthians 13. We abide in him and he abides in us so that we can love as he loves and live as he loves and, and live as he lives. And, and this... This gets back to Jim's point. This is what separates us from those who are godless or those who are pagan. It doesn't matter whether they're going to love me in return. My being loved by them is inconsequential. The only thing I worry about is that God loves me. Um, what he holds me accountable for is not their response to me, but how well I love them. Am I really laying down my life for them, the same way that the Good Samaritan laid down his life for the guy there in the ditch. Jesus leaves that story open. What happened when the Samaritan went back to the inn where the man was laying? Was the man appreciative? Was the man grateful? Did he say thank you? We don't know. And, and the reason I think Jesus leaves that open is that it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether the man's grateful or not. Um, I've told the story before of uh, uh, my uh, Methodist pastor friend in South Carolina who uh, always sent a group on Tuesday nights to an inner city soup kitchen. And uh, the, uh, the Sarah Taylor of the, uh, of the church was not going to, she, she went after that Jim Marshall kind of guy, you know. 
and she was going to make him go. And so finally, he, he knew that he would just give up, you know, that he would go just to placate her. So we went, and they, they worked all night long, cleaned up the kitchen, and the van ride on the way back, she asked him, well, what did you think? And he said, I'm never going back. What do you mean? Those were the most ungrateful, rude, selfish people I've ever seen in my life. And she said, yes, I know, wasn't it wonderful? And, and she said, what do you mean wonderful? He said, look, she, she says to him, look, God never said I had to like them. God only said I had to love them the same way he loves them. And if they're rude to me, if, they're, if they act selfishly, if they're ungrateful, that has absolutely nothing to do with whether or not I love them. And so absolutely, I'm going back next week. And she cut her eyes down on him and said, and so are you. All right, verse 14. We have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. This kind of love, this agape love of God, is how we understand the salvation of the world. This is why the Jews, even the disciples, struggled so much with the idea that the, of a Messiah who wasn't going to destroy the Romans. This is what we've been waiting for forever, to finally get the Messiah that we want to take care of the problems that we see, which is number one, getting rid of the Romans and, and giving our nation back to us. No, that's, that's, that's not the Messiah that God had in mind. It's not the Messiah God told Isaiah about hundreds of years before. This is not the Messiah who's going to destroy the Romans when he comes preaching that we are to love our enemies and to do good to those who persecute us. A contemporary of Jesus was a Roman uh, known as Seneca the Younger, uh, so-called because he was named for his father, who's known as Seneca the Elder. Yep. And he said the, the problem with people is that they are desperately conscious of their weakness in necessary things. That people wanted a hand down to lift them up. Yeah. Uh, we're well aware of our weaknesses. We're well aware of our pains. We're well aware of our struggles. But Seneca could never see where that hand down was going to come from. Uh, and he, uh, and in so many of his plays and his, his writings on philosophy and so forth were so very dark and bitter and hopeless. Well, yeah, because he didn't know about Jesus. So yes, God so loved the world that he sent his only son into the world to save the world from its depression, from its fears, from its anxieties, from its hatred, from its bitterness, its temptations, from its chains. Grief can be a chain. Addiction can be a chain. There are so many things that can make us prisoners. God so loved the world that he gave his hand down, he gave his only son to save the world from its fears, its it struggles, it's stupidity, it's sin. God so loved the world that he was willing to save the world from all of that. It's because of God's unconditional, sacrificial, agape love that Christ has come to save us from everything that we lay at the foot of the cross. That's an amazing thing, isn't it? There are people who live their lives in fear all of their life and they come to Jesus and they're not afraid anymore. They put their own fear at the foot of the cross and Christ takes away their fear. They put away their anxieties. They put away their frustrations. They put away their anger. Uh, it, it truly is an, an amazing, amazing thing. Um, I don't know if you recall Sweetwater folks, the, the fellow who uh, attended our church for a while 
Uh, his name was Anthony. First Sunday Anthony was here, Anthony had the full attention of our security team because Anthony comes in with a backpack and he just doesn't look right. Uh, so uh, we get to know Anthony and lo and behold, because it is a small world, uh, I find that Anthony's from New York and Anthony for years attended a church that is the only church in New York I have any connection with at all. Um, it's a church uh, in, in, in Manhattan called Graffiti. Um, it's a Southern Baptist church, although you'd have to dig hard to find that any, written anywhere. Um, started by the North American Mission Board years and years and years ago. And their ministry was to the homeless and the junkies, uh, the addicts, the, the, the least and the lost in, in that part of Manhattan. Uh, the first time I, I ever visited there, uh, uh, they were uh, uh, taking uh, uh, what they called care bags, basically just little brown paper bags uh, that had a uh, peanut butter and jelly sandwich in it, had a toothbrush in it, had some dental floss in it, uh, some uh, sanitary wipes in it, and so forth. And they were going to go hand them out at the park where all the junkies were passed out and laid out and they did that uh, about four days a week and as we got out of the car in front of the place um, there's a uh, uh, there's a, a guy who is uh, an alcoholic uh, I mean you could you could smell the alcohol from three feet away uh, sitting on the steps and the guy I'm with greets him like an old friend how you doing and um, his name was Reed Harden, my, my friend. And uh, the fellow on the steps said, uh, uh, I'm doing good. How are you? And Reed said, well, we're, we're good. We're, we're looking for the pastor. And he said, oh, you're looking for my friend. He's here. He's here. He's upstairs. Um, I, I know that he would love to see you. And the third person who was with us said, are, are you sure you'd love to see us? And he said, oh yeah, he'd, he'd love to see anybody. Um, so here's this guy that most people don't want to even touch, let alone hug. And when we asked him about the pastor, he didn't say, the pastor's upstairs. He didn't say, call him by name. He said, my friend is upstairs. So we go up and we meet with the pastor and he wants to show us around a little bit. And we walk back out. The guy hadn't moved. I'm not all sure that he could move a lot. Uh, and when he comes out, the pastor did hug him and said, uh, how are you doing today? And he said, well, I'm hurting a little bit today. And he said, okay, well, let me finish with, with my new friends here and, and I'll, I'll come back and uh, we'll, we'll talk some more then. And, uh, you know, here's a guy who is a saint, not because he's better than anybody else, the way that we misuse that word, but because the love of God abides in him and he in the love of God. And so he's able to embrace the least and the lost. And when I made that first trip there, that was back in 1997. So I got to know Anthony a little bit, and Anthony suggested I, I give him a call, and so I did. I called the, the church up, and I talked to the associate pastor, talked to the pastor, reminded him of the couple of times that we met back in those days. And that church has grown. They've got multiple campuses now. But you know what they're still doing? Hugging those people, you know, touching those people putting peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and toothpaste in the hands of those people. Uh, showing them the love of Christ, regardless of what their response back is. Because our job is not to get a response. That's up to God. Our job is to show the love of God, no matter who he puts in our path. Anthony um, moved down to uh, the, Miami uh, because 
Uh, Anthony's issues were largely uh, PTSD issues related to his time in the military. And uh, the VA hospital down there was going to be able to enroll him into a program that he couldn't get here. Um, and so he uh, uh, gathered his stuff in his backpack and headed to Miami to be able to get the treatment at the VA hospital there. Um, and he had been backpacking all the way from New York uh, to here. Uh, and because uh, his doctor said, you need to be in a warmer climate. Uh, you don't need any more New York winters, uh, you know, Florida or Arizona. And he said, well, I've been to Arizona, so I figured I'd go to Florida. And uh, so uh, God's doing some neat things there. All right, let's have a word of prayer and we'll look at our prayer list. Father, if it was easy, something we could do on our own without breaking a sweat, everybody would do it. But when it comes to loving like Christ loves, there's only one way, Lord, and that's going to be with the spirit of Christ within us, changing us and empowering us to be able to love the way he loves. To love the Anthonys of the world just as they are. Because that's the way you change the world. And so, Father, thank you for the truth of your word, the power of your word. It's not enough just to love those who love us. The greatest happiness is not loving and being loved. The greatest joy is loving like Christ loves and seeing the power of Christ in our own lives and in the lives of those who he touches through us. Thank you, Lord, for being with us tonight. For my brothers and sisters here, bless us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.